gotcha. <laughs> Are you uh, laid up with injury or just waking up? I went to the gym and then I was just watching the last episode of the series that they're going to air tonight. Awesome. How many episodes are there? Six. Okay. Um, it's not airing tonight, July 18th, right? Yeah, they're doing a premiere at the, uh, here in Santa Monica or at, uh, what's the name of this hotel? What? The yeah. Fairmont, the Fairmont. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Well, I'm going to open just by saying, I think uh, I feel a certain amount of pride for you. I feel proud of you, even though we've never met. I feel like you've been toiling away um, almost in the periphery of the surf industry and haven't gotten the accolade, you know, uh, that you would think you deserve based on the achievements that you've made. And so to see kind of this happen for you with HBO is a pretty big moment. Yeah, it's definitely special. And um, I, they did a really good job. They did a good uh, job. Well, I think they did a phenomenal job. Um, okay. And it's interesting because <clears throat> there's so many little, uh, I don't know, inventions that you've made or developments in safety precaution and methods of pickup or that you actually implemented and pioneered that I did not know about up until watching the documentary. And it's like, I followed surfing intensely since I was 12 years old and I followed you, but there, I feel like surf media or journalism hasn't covered so much of the things that they kind of unpacked for me in the documentary. So as a like really, um, you know, serious, uh, somebody who takes surfing seriously and tries to track all of it, a lot of this information was new to me. Oh, that's fun. That's uh, must have been super interesting, especially Nazareth, because everything was new there. Totally. Um, in regard to me kind of referring to the surf industry, having like left some of this stuff in the periphery or like I just hadn't been exposed to it. Do you ever feel like throughout the course of your career that the surf industry hasn't quite given you the accolade that you deserve for the achievements? Uh, you know, what? in the uh, XXL Awards, I focused my career around the XXL Awards and always did really well. They always um, they always awarded me what I thought I should be awarded. Uh, my partners were usually got the, yeah, my partners should have won a lot more awards. Uh, that really was not, that may be pretty sad. Uh, like Ikaika Kalama and uh, Kaylee Mamala, both guys that had the biggest wave of the year or the best ride of the year and never got any credit for it. Um, for, for me personally, back in the day, promoting yourself was very frowned upon. Right. And I had sponsors that were either in Japan or in Brazil and they promoted me like crazy in, in Portugal. I mean, in Brazil and in Japan, there was billboards at, in Tokyo and billboards at the airport in Sao Paulo and Playboy magazine and outside magazine ads every month. I mean, they, they went crazy with me in these other countries. In uh, United States, I didn't work with any mainstream or any... Um, industry sponsors so they had no desire to promote me it would take from their athletes yeah. so i was definitely uh, kind of maybe by my own choice because i went with these companies that were in different countries um yeah and i started working with no fear and i started working with red bull and um, Quicksilver wanted to sponsor me, and and I and I started getting a um, a bunch of de requests and desires from from uh, United countries in U.S. and things. Yeah, I started getting a lot of promotion and started getting a lot of attention and notice, and and things were going in the direction in in United States that uh, it was going in the other countries, and then by chance, double upon Portugal. And 
before I got to Portugal, I was also focusing on companies that aren't in the surf industry because they're much more professional. And if you give them the right materials to utilize your image on these giant waves, they're going to succeed mightily in getting eyeballs on their companies and they're going to promote the hell out of you and you're going to be able to earn a lot more money with these companies like Caterpillar and I'm mean, going to work with Caterpillar out of the United States, um, a bunch of different uh, Sobe, Pepsi, different companies that um, really supported me really well, but we're not in the surf industry. And then when we went to Portugal and discovered that this wave was rideable and just and and um, shared it with the world, then I didn't have to knock on any more doors. All these companies from all these different countries and all these uh, mainstream companies were coming after me. Then it was be very careful who you partner with, make sure they're in line with your core beliefs and make sure they're in line with your values. We, we were very, uh, we're all so impressionable and whatever we share that we're involved with, the rest of the world might grab onto it or might gravitate towards it and be interested in, in consuming it or purchasing it. So then I felt this huge sense of responsibility to stick to my guns. I didn't have to scratch and take the scraps or take whatever would be thrown my way. I also, you know, I, I started reading some really meaningful books, which changed my thought process and changed my desires. And, and my wife, Nicole, really helped me a lot with making purpose-driven choices, conscious choices, choices where we're contributing instead of just consuming the world. This, today is we're just a bunch of consumers and it's just a challenging place for for us to be as humans for all the animals for the environment for the i mean i don't want to get into climate change and what's going on with with the weather and and all those different things that are you know gray areas but it, it's it's a crazy time and and we got to share the right messages and and, and hopefully guide people to make contact just choices and good choices. Um, Nicole sounds like not only a guiding light, but like a super strong support system and savvy business person and all that sort of stuff to have as a partner. Yeah, she's my everything. Nicole is uh, my muse for lack of a better word, but it's much more than that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, um, reference the books if you don't mind or just what genre are you talking are they like spiritual books or meditative type books it's funny the one that i gravitate towards most and it's i'd like to i it's my bible for lack of a better word is it's not really a spiritual book but it's called seven spiritual laws of success i think it should be guide to a meet purposeful life or a meaningful life or guide to a better life so that you know in layman's terms everybody could could uh, gravitate towards it because sometimes spiritual will turn you off but if you saw the seven spiritual laws of success you go oh this is going to be about about uh religion or something but if you saw guide to a better life you're like, hmm, okay that's interesting i want to have a better yeah. life <laughs> um in regard to that in when you were 35 in this documentary series, you talk about writing yourself a business plan. Um, you were kind of getting out of professional surfing. You had started a small business, retail business on the North shore. And um, you decided to make one last go at surfing and you wrote a business plan for what your professional surf career would be like. Can you tell me more about that? I like to call it more of a blueprint or a roadmap. Um, and it's, really just so you have purpose all day every day so you know what you're working towards and every second that you spend working on what you wrote down on this business plan brings you closer to succeeding and every second you spend not working on what brings you further away both are still possible one way might get you there quicker but 
if you focus on what's on that paper and you, you focus first, you write your goal, whatever it may be, a musician, a photographer, a surfer. Uh, mine was keep surfing. Under that was, I, there was two big events coming up that I felt I could win. One was the Eddie Ical, which I lived closer than all the surfers in the event, except I was an alternate. I was like the seventh alternate. And number two was the Jaws towing contest, first of its kind, $70,000 purse, biggest purse ever won. I don't know if it's still to date. And no, uh, it isn't, but it was at uh, the time. The US, okay. Open did a the US Open did $100,000 shortly thereafter. And that's for one person with the toe yeah. and it's 70 split between two. <laughs> right. <laughs> wow, yeah, this you got was your history. I like it. <laughs> this was 2002, though, the toe in um, World Cup at Jaws, right? Yes, yes. It was amazing. It was really good conditions, really well done. Um, Studio Mega out of Brazil sponsored it and they did a really good job i have to say um so the business plan win jaws win the eddie i had so the night before they, they call the contest on well okay so let me let me go back to what's yeah. on the list so under under winning these so keep surfing win these two events to keep surfing how do i win these two events my training program my eating program and my manifesting, meditating, focusing program. And I wrote those, that list and I put it on the refrigerator. I put it on the bathroom mirror. I put it in the car. Back then we didn't have uh, cell phones that had, a, they were just like s s smartphones, I think you would call them, but they didn't Blackberry. have the black. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, I looked at that list when I woke up. I looked at that list when I was driving around. I looked at that list all day, every day and focused on doing what was on the list. And then the day came that the Jaws and they called the contest on and they did both of them on the same day. It was crazy. So the night before I'm stressing, which, which event do I go to? I had my partner waiting on Maui but I had the Eddie, which was my dream and my favorite event in the world, the, war, the event that I really longed to win forever. And at 4 a.m., I made the decision to go to Jaws. And I was an alternate in the Eddie the year before. I show up seventh alternate they send me out for my heat like third the uh, second or third heat i got in i paddled all the way out i'm in the lineup getting ready for the heat to start and here comes the all the, the alternate before me elijah young shows up out of the blue paddles out garrett i got here in time you got to go in so i'm probably the only surfer in history ever to have to Go out in the end, you thinking, yes, I got in. And then I had to paddle in. It was the most devastating experience ever. And still I was torn. I was like ninth alternate the next year. And I was still torn whether to stay and try and get in or go to Jaws. So glad I decided to go to Jaws. We ended up winning the event. Uh, ended up closing the store shortly after working with a lot of amazing that's when no fear and excel and pepsi and and um actually i was with red bull at that time and and quicksilver wanted to sponsor me if i could go back in time i would have probably stayed with red bull and probably went with quicksilver but i had a manager who kind of was he's like no you go with so with Pepsi, uh, with uh, No Fear and a No Fear Energy Drink, you're the only athlete, you'll be the only guy, they'll utilize you. And I'm like, okay. And, uh, but anyway, I wouldn't have wanted to be with Red Bull because that's the last product I would like to endorse, even though, you know, I love what they do for the athletes. They take really good care of the athletes. But as far as being impressionable, I mean, that's the last product you want to push on kids and on and anybody for that matter so um win the event 
close my store, get all these amazing partners and um, continue my surfing career. It was, and I really did give up on surfing. I gave up. I was done. I was over. I was going to have a store. I was going to, you know, take care of my family through this business. And, and uh, it's a, it's, it was a 35. The, the thing that I like to share is that it's never too early and never too late to write that plan. Now, what I've learned recently, well, not recently, you need to have a selfless approach. You need to figure out how you're going to give back, how you're going to contribute through your passion. And, and your business plan should revolve around your passion, what you love to do, and then how you're going to contribute, and then your roadmap. And you got to be really, really careful what you write on that business plan or that roadmap as your goal. Because if you take a very realistic approach to the to all the things you need to do to achieve your goal, it will happen. You will achieve it. But you got to be careful. You'll make sure it's what you really want. <laughs> I love it. This is great insight. Um, in a really unusual turn of events, uh, again, something I really didn't understand the nuance of until the documentary you get invited by essentially the town mayor and city council to Nazare. Um, I've never seen such a concerted effort to pop popularize a surf spot before. <laughs> it's usually people trying to keep people away from a surf spot, but I'll let you kind of explain it better than I, but the, over, the, the overall thing is they have this wave that they think is possibly rideable. They've seen you win the Piahi event. And so they reach out to you and they're like, hey, can you come and attempt to ride this wave? The, the funniest thing about it all is, uh, and I've just shared, they just shared this information with me like two years ago. I saw it in an interview. They didn't even tell me personally, but I saw it in an interview from Dino, who was the guy who dreamed of having somebody ride his waves. They reached out to Laird Hamilton first. Oh my I gosh. Yes, through his website. No reply. Then they reached out to Carlos Burley second. No reply. I was third string, but I replied in a second. He said, that Oh my hilarious. God. Oh my God. It's Garen McNamara. He replied. <laughs> that we is so to, funny. We have to bring him, but sure, he will die, but we have to see anyway. <laughs> And Laird, I mean, there is interview footage in the documentary of Laird saying, you know, it just, no, nah, it's too windy. It's too crossed up. It's a beach yeah. break. Like, so he probably read the email and just wrote him off, you know? Or, you know, um, some of us, especially back then, weren't like on our email every day, checking sure. everything. And I was that guy. I'm like super, uh, I don't know, wouldn't say responsible, but responsive. <laughs> okay. Which again, talking about that life plan and lesson, I love that you took this risk, you know, because yeah. there's a bunch of people who don't, who aren't diligent and things slip through the cracks, but this is a real moment where, uh, you know, opportunity meets preparation where you've done all the prep on your side and this rare opportunity shows up and you seized the moment. And let's be honest, the mayor's objective was to popularize a surf spot. You far overachieved his goals. Like the, <laughs> the way that Nazare has blown up in the last decade is just uncomparable to any other surf spot on the world. It's crazy. Yeah. Just what has transpired in that short amount of time, short period of time. So it's, I know it's you, really unbelievable. I know you cover it a bit in the doc, but um, what was that like showing up there and what was your assessment of the spot and was it surfable in your eyes? Well, first I had been emailing with Dino for about five years and he would send me, uh, but if the team Jose Gregorio, he actually tried to toe surf it in like 2005 and he sent me pictures of the yard sale that happened to you know, jet skis everywhere blown up and everybody swimming and everything everywhere. And then I would call him in the middle of the night. How's this swell? Can I I'd monitor the swells? Is this wind good? I was kept, was the first the email I sent him, is there any jet skis there? They're yeah, in Lisbon about an hour away. And then I said, okay, so 
what winds are good, what swell direction is good. And that, you know, kept going for about five years. And then my wife, Nicole, saw the email chain and she's like, what is this? What, what, what's going what, Who are these guys? Like, well, it's some, some, some guys in Portugal want me to come surf their wave and see if it's any good, see if it's big. And uh, if it's big and good, can I help promote the town? And she's like, oh, wow, that sounds interesting. What, should we go? Do you want to go? And I'm like, yeah, that looks, yeah, let's go check it out. So we're like one month after she sees this email chain, she organizes with Paulo Caldera to get us on a plane and get us there. So it was really Nicole that is to, to uh, get, thank for all the success of Nazare in Portugal. And because without her seeing this email chain, we would have never went. And if we didn't go, tow surfing was dead. There was nobody riding jet skis there. The one team that was just lost all their equipment, did what exactly what they thought would happen there. Nobody thought it was possible to surf it. Jose Gregorio went out to try and prove that it was, ended up losing everything. So then, yes, nail in the coffin. It's not surfable. You can't get back out. If you lose the guy or you lose your ski, you're not going to be able to get back out. That was what was thought was to be true because it's a beach break of just crazy heights and there's no way back out through beach break. Like Puerto Escondido, when it's big, you got to drive all the way down to the boat ramp to go back out. You can't yeah. make it back out. Once in a while, you get lucky. But if it's over 20 feet or over, you can't. You literally got to drive all the way to the boat ramp and go back out through that little channel. And that's what was believed to be true in Nazare until that first day when uh, Cody and Al, Al says it perfect. He, he says that that was when we realized that it was possible. It's because yeah. of those sideways chops. You know, if we didn't have those sideways chops, because the sideways chops literally, uh, they just reverberate off the cliff. And then they cancel out the wave. They turn it in a 40 foot face. They turn it into a two foot wave. Yeah. Like when they go sideways and you go right on the side of that sideways chop and fly over the white water and then fly to the next spot. And, and so, uh, yeah, we get there and it was you know, like a fairy tale, like a dream. Um, there's this cool little fishing village, and, but it was uh, interesting because nobody wanted anything to do with this project. Nobody believed it was even possible to, they didn't, they didn't realize the waves were big first, that, that big. They didn't realize they were rideable. And if they were rideable, since the small days is where everybody died there, they thought for sure we were going to die. We, so they really didn't want to know us and they didn't want to be involved with the project. And in the uh, first year was was uh, very interesting. It wasn't tough because we, we knew, we believed, and we from the first day we saw it, we're like, oh my God, this is special. Because I had seen the photo of that little Jeep on the cliff. So that was uh, the first time I said, send me a picture. And he sent me this most magnificent picture. It looked just like Jaws, but nobody on it. So I was just mm -hmm. like, oh my God. So then we get there and we go to the cliff and, and I see that it is gigantic, but it's blown out. It's, it's just terrible, like really, really bad conditions but I had seen the picture of it with good conditions. So I was like, Oh, this is special. And, uh, it just went from there. Yeah. One of the stories in the film or in the documentary series is about, um, Nicole's wipeout. Mm -hmm. So Nicole, your wife is the first female to ever tow surf Nazare. Hey, yes, Nicole, she <laughs> she's got to make an appearance. <laughs> you said, um, Nicole, your wife is the I first one to toe surf Nazareth. Well, <laughs> that's me. Tell me, I mean, she seemed traumatized by the experience, but what was your perspective on it? I mean, how frightening is that uh, to have your wife in that type of a situation? The interesting thing about that situation was I hadn't been pounded there yet. And I didn't realize how violent and strong it was. So as that experience happened and she uh, 
got pounded in. I was just like, ah, you know, you'll be fine. I, I didn't think much of it until I tried to take her back out. And she was like, shell shock, just, yeah, she got PTSD from the wipeout and she was never the same in big waves again. When we went there, she's like, I'm going to beat Maya. I'm going to be the best <laughs> big wave surfer. And I'm just like, oh my God, I got this amazing partner. My wife is going to be my partner. This is too good to be true. And in one instant, she yeah, said, no, Nic Nicole, you're going to stay on the beach. I get Garrett. He's my man. You, <laughs> I, <laughs> And Nicole's okay. She's okay with Nazare being my mistress, but nobody else. <laughs> right. Um, talking about the ferocity, talking about the ferocity of the wipeout. I mean, you still hear criticism about the wave being a mush burger. Um, let's talk about that. And I want you to defend against it. And then also let's talk about, is there an objective way to measure a wave height? I won't defend against it because on the big days, it usually is pretty mushy unless we have the perfect Southeast winds or glassy, or it's, it's all depending on the sandbar. It's all depending on the direction of the swell and uh, the wind direction or the wind strength. Now on the days that are 15 feet and under, it's hollow. It's like pipe, it's like back door, it's like slabby. It's like in between a slab and pipe and back door. Uh, once it gets to the certain size, it, it kind of teepees up in the corner and does that weird collapse kind of avalanche, which is crazy because it looks fat and soft, but it's not, it's, it's so powerful. It's, it's, it picks up speed and picks up momentum and turns into an avalanche in the ocean, uh, even when it's mushy. Now you'll have that first peak that stands up super tall, has a pretty hollow right, but it goes into the rocks and has a fat left, but sometimes it'll have a little barrel at the top, but not too predictable. But then you have this other peak, it's called in, in between first and second, the middle peak. That one stands up perfect, has a hollow left and right, the right will be short and hollow. The left will be long and hollow. And uh, it's just, you know, every day is different. That's what's so special about Nazare and every wave is different. And, you know, they do have very defined spots that the swells focus on and they do break in very, in, in the same spot, especially on first peak and on second peak and on third peak, but second peak and third peak move around with the tide and first peak moves in and out with the tide. But first peak breaks right there close to the rock, sometimes on the rocks, sometimes in the middle and sometimes a little further from the rocks, but it's always right on first peak. Second peak, left and right. First, in between first and second is the magic wave that comes and it doesn't have to be the biggest wave of the day to be the biggest wave of the day. It goes inside of a little in from first and second peak and just magnifies and intensifies and wedges and runs. And that's the magic wave. That one might be where the biggest waves are ridden because they're top to bottom. And if you get to the bottom, their true height's going to be measured. Uh, the first peak is definitely the biggest, tallest longest slope but it's fat usually and they don't give it the credit it deserves in the media in the in the measuring in in uh in the politics yeah um, so measuring the waves is so subjective like if you want to go from the floor of the, the the water not the ocean floor but the floor of the water where the wave starts and you want to try and find the top that's, we never measure from the actual floor. No, you're supposed to measure the contour of the wave all the way till it flattens out. Swell to crest. I mean, I'm, I'm crest to trough. trough. Yeah, crest to trough. So we never measure from the trough. We're always like 10, 20 feet or 10 or 20 feet from the trough. And uh, the, the rules are really 
they seem to be very clear in the description, in the rules, in the, in the book, but then they're very subjective when it comes time to uh, measure. And which, the bot, which book the, are you talking about? Or the WSL rule book or whatever. The Big Wave know. World Tour. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So the, the hardest part of the whole thing is finding the bottom. And then the other part is, okay, where do we measure from? And this is where it gets really interesting. And it's interesting for me on both sides. Okay, so you're riding down this 80 foot wave and they say you need to measure. I don't know what the rules are these days. I haven't read them for the last few days, few, few years, but the last time I read it, it was where the surfer is on the wave. Then you go up from there and you go down from there where you sit. The top's easy, the bottom. And then the angle of the photo, one photo right. will be 80 feet. The other photo will be 40 feet. It's really crazy how much difference it is depending on the photo. In Nazareth, when you're on the cliff low, usually a 60 foot wave will look at the most 40. And if you're on the cliff high, a 60 foot wave will look 50 or 60 feet. So the spot where the photo's taken from makes a big difference. But Jen, so say you got this photo that you feel giving it justice, it's taken from the right spot, the height's there. So then you got to find the bottom of the wave and the top is easy. And then you got to figure out how tall that surfer actually is in his crouch position or whatever position he's standing on. And uh, then measure how many people are in between. The, the subjective part is where's the bottom and how tall is this surfer actually, whatever you figure out to scale him to. And then the really tricky part is, okay, should we be measuring where the wave is reaching at full potential about 10, 20 feet behind you? Or should we be measuring where that surfer is on the wave? I was very against measuring where the surfer is on the wave and measure the wave at its full potential. But then you bring in to the fact that I could put my 90 year old grandmother on a 120 foot wave on the shoulder where there's a big channel and she could ride that wave and kick out without even getting close to the lip, without even getting close to the white water. So would that be fair? Would, they, would you call that the 100 foot wave? So that's where I tend to agree with measuring where the surfer is. But then, you know, I think if the surfer's in a critical part of the wave, you should probably just measure the full potential of the wave. But if the surfer's so far on the shoulder, you see, that's where it's, that's where I don't know. Uh, I kind of like measuring where the surfer is on the wave. It's a disaster, dude. Everything you just described <laughs> is a disaster. <laughs> There's, there's no anywhere, there's not even close to an objective way to do this. You know, like there, every, every single criteria that you just gave had 50 variables baked around it. And so it's just like, it's impossible. It's almost a yeah. fool's errand to try. To Luckily for the powers that be that get to put numbers on them and put awards on them and guide the judges and the, and the spectators and the, the online voters, whatever direction they want, they can easily sway it wherever they want it to go. Yeah, of course. Well, I feel like they got it wrong <laughs> this past year with Maya versus Justine. I felt like Justine had an arguable case for her wave being bigger. I, I will say that Maya is amazing. And she has of done course. she above and beyond what all of us men do. And she's come back from the most horrific pain, years of pain and still surfing. And now she's pain free of, for the most part with her back. She became it. I mean, when that first wave that she aided on in. Uh, oh, shoot. Somebody's trying to call it. Let me close that. The first, you know, in, in 2010 when she, or 12 when she got injured, she broke her leg on the on the second that she airdropped. And then she airdropped again. And when she hit, she broke her leg. That wasn't told in the story. That should be told. Crazy. And then she didn't really have much flotation on. Everything got her, her life jacket blown off. 
Oh my she God. was, she had a super thin little thing under her wetsuit, if I'm not mistaken, which is the only reason she survived. And wow. she made it where no man has gone through before. She endured what no man has endured. And um, then she comes back year after year after year, better, better. Her driving skills are as good or better than anybody out there. Her, her uh, surfing, her ability to choose and make waves is as good or better than anybody out there. She went a little harder than she would normally go in the contest and got taken out by that wave. See, now this is where it gets super subjective and super gray. Um, and I don't want, I'm definitely not going to say anything bad about Maya, but when it comes to the rules you and, and these awards, to get the biggest wave, you got to make it, supposedly. It depends on who surfed it. Like, a years back, Nathan Fletcher got the ride of the year for getting pounded in the tube at Chopo. And I'm like, wait, I thought you were supposed to make your maneuver. That The maneuver was the barrel and you didn't make it. Right. But then that's where it made no, no sense it's because he wasn't sponsored by Billabong. Or maybe they wanted to sell product in the United States, so they wanted a United States surf. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's real, you know, the, the underworld of surfing has their reasons. Sometimes there's no rhyme or reason. I don't know why. Um, for Maya, it, I don't feel it should have been counted because she didn't make it, first of all. And I would say that there was definitely bigger waves ridden by men that year and potentially by Justine. That was... Um, I mean, that was politics at its best. Maya just happened to be in the middle of it all. And right. it's not her, not her fault at all. And, and then again, it's just my opinion, my feelings. And I don't know for sure. Maybe it was just the way it was supposed to be. And, and, it's, and it's true and it's real. And that was the biggest wave. And she should have got credit for not making the wave. Um, I don't know the rules anymore. So I definitely going to plead the fifth on this one. But my gut says she should have had to make the wave and it wasn't the biggest wave of the year. And it was uh, WSL politics trying to grow women surfing. Yep. I stand by that. Um, the other... <laughs> I have no problem standing by that. I, I started out by just saying how it's a fool's errand anyways. And so when the rules are all this gray, no matter who you deem is the winner, there's going to be a whole camp of people who see it a different way. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's not objective enough, but there's yeah. one, there's one criteria that I've never heard talked about that I would love to get your opinion on something that I've talked about a lot, which is uh, wave height certainly matters and needs to be a, a part of the criteria, but there's energy in the wave that somehow we need to figure out how to measure a six foot or let's say an eight foot wave at back door is infinitely gnarlier than a 10 foot wave at Huntington Beach. And so if we were just using height as the criteria, you would put a photo of the eight foot back door wave versus a 10 foot uh, Huntington wave, do the measurements that you explained and go, oh, this surfer in Huntington wins the bigger wave. But all of us in surfing know that's nowhere near as gnarly. It's nowhere near as difficult. It's, and if you eat it, you're not going to get pounded as hard and all that. So there needs to be like a order, like a magnet, the way that earthquakes are measured by magnitude, you know, like how do we measure the PSI of the energy of Nazare versus Mavericks versus Waimea? They have a new system that everybody uses in Nazare all last year. And I think even the year before, and they're all interested in the energy. And there's one of these websites that says what the energy of the storm that's coming at you is, is uh, what it type of energy it has. And they've it's been pretty accurate. Like I'll see the swell that I think is gonna be this big and I'll see my buddy and he'll go, oh, but it doesn't have the energy. Did you see the energy? The energy isn't there. And I'm just like, okay, what's the energy? <laughs> yeah. So they have a site now that's measuring the energy in Nazareth. I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if it's the energy of the storm itself or the energy that's moving through the water. Yeah, I don't even know how they're getting it and I don't know where, but I'm going to find out because it is super interesting. Now, here's a whole nother, we can throw this wrench into the spokes. When we're surfing these waves, 
the the height of the wave it should i feel it should be the length of the wave not 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 how long you're surfing it but how long the actual face is okay so if you look at a wave and you look at the contour of the face and how long that actually is that's what we're surfing so the contour of the face is definitely 10 or 20 feet bigger so we probably have ridden 100 foot waves if we were measuring the face value not crest to trough i get it i've never thought about that before but i get that yeah i mean but, but there's okay. no again there's no way to measure it and then <laughs> On top of all of that is the things constantly shift shifting, right? So like the peak is different than 10 feet away from the peak and the peak then hits maybe the sandbar a little bit and lurches even higher. And maybe the photo was taken before that lurch. So it really does feel like a fool's errand that can never actually be um, objectively measured. It's like, I'm going to, uh, excuse me for a second, but uh, it's like measuring the length of your genitals you measure <laughs> from from your butthole under your balls in front of your balls <laughs> everybody's got their own <laughs> and everybody's is a fish story it's like yeah it was actually it was a 30 pounder <laughs> um I've my got wife it. says cut that out you got no way that. That's the part we're going to use to advertise the episode. Uh, so uh, I got a couple of closing questions, but one final thought on Nazare before we get into the closing stuff. Um, you hear a lot of people, when a, when a surf spot becomes popularized, a lot of the locals obviously gripe about how it's changed and how crowded it is. Can you tell me what you've seen as both the positive changes and the new risks or challenge uh changes negative changes that you've experienced at nazare as a result of the popularity well the the interesting thing about all the funny thing is you know you gotta be careful what you ask for and um you know everybody always wants more um opportunities and more ways of uh generating income and and uh, so these little towns that are just super special and 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 uh, really stuck in their own little time zones and their own little ways, and they see all these glamorous things going on in other parts of the world or in other towns in their country, and they want to have more and be more. And then all of a sudden they get it, and they're like, "Oh shit!" Now the price of houses are going up. The streets are crowded in the winter time not just the summer and luckily in portugal their influx of local tourism in the summertime it's back when we first got there in 2010 there was 10,000 in the winter and a hundred thousand in the summer in nazare so they were used to a crazy influx of people in the summer so and still today not half as many people come in the winter i mean there's these days that a lot of every there's foreigners now there's not just the locals you know there's tons of foreigners which is amazing it's whole new uh whole new economy but they were already used to so many people coming but they weren't used to so many people desiring their real estate and um so many foreigners coming in the winter time and so many foreigners coming all year long and now uh, the surf is a bit more crowded. I mean, the body borders still rule it. The yeah. body borders are the true locals. And when it's like, you know, 10 feet and under, 20 foot faces and under, the body borders are out there ruling. They, you know, they really like it about 8 to 12 foot, you know, 4 to 6 foot Hawaiian. For some reason, we measure half of the wave i'm not sure where that came from but i actually do know where it came from but um yeah so the body borders still rule it they definitely get a little frustrated here and there and they get a little arguments here and there but um the real locals the the guys who rule the spots have all seized the opportunity they become jet ski drivers they become filmers they become surfers themselves um they've really embraced it and they really uh, appreciate it and love it um, but there, there, you know, there's other situations, uh, moments, days where it's just out of control and 
you know, this guy or that guy might have a bad day and might have a bad experience with, with somebody who might not have been there if this didn't all happen. And, you know, there's a little, you know, definitely some challenges here and there. But overall, everybody's super happy about it. And um, overall, it's just been a, a godsend for the, uh, for, the, for the town and for the country, this wave. And um, overall, uh, it's yeah, been a, a fairy tale. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, one thing that we haven't discussed at all, and it's almost the most important detail of all of this, is your age. Um, I mean, it's remarkable. I want to know how is your preparation different at age 53 than it was, let's say when you were 30. The preparation, uh, the goal is work smart. Okay. Damn it. Hold on. Lost your work, video. Work, work smarter, not harder. But if hard is smart, work hard too. Um, Definitely be very uh, strategic and focused on the training and what we let consume our time, what we, what we choose to spend our time doing and on, and how we choose to uh, train and spend our days. And I have this amazing uh, coach, trainer, I mean, I, I call her a healer. She doesn't like to be called a healer, but she's definitely a healer. Her name is Sherry Gunaway, and she um, has the best training program ever. And she tells me exactly what to do. And as long as I do exactly what she says, everything just progresses and gets better. And if I slack a bit, then you can, I definitely feel it. And I, you know, it takes a little longer to get where I want to get. But overall, my body feels the best it's ever felt. There's wow. no pain anywhere. I'm not in my best shape. My legs are in my best shape of my life. My legs are stronger and better than they've ever been since I was 15. My uh, upper half of my body is a little soft still. and needs a little work. But underneath the fat, I'm, my, my abs are really strong. Uh, my shoulders are strong, pain-free. I've had this little kink in my neck for a bit that's finally gone on the airplane ride. Somehow it went away. It's really interesting. Hmm. Um, it's a lot of water. Water is life. You drink Coke, just as much water as you can, but you need to sip it. You can't just gulp, you know, a, a, a half gallon of water here and then another half gallon of water there just goes right through you. You have to sip the water, um, but just all throughout the day. And then your body utilizes it. And then eating healthy is, you know, the key. What we put in is what we get out. You want to run on regular or, or you want to run on diesel or you want to run on super. Uh, and when I'm, when I'm living my best life, I'm eating super clean, uh, mostly greens, uh, vegetarian, vegan even. Even the best I've ever felt, I did raw program for six months. During that raw program, I actually drank more water than I ever drank before. So I'm not sure if it was the raw food or the water, but the combination definitely, I felt best, the best I've ever felt. I've been really um, training smart, but eating, I've been enjoying whatever <laughs> put, put in front of me, wherever we go. And my wife is a foodie beyond. So we go to all these nice restaurants and eat all this amazing food. But when I get home, I'm going to do a month straight of just eating off the land, our house. So I have um, some noni juice, which we make from a noni tree. I have a bunch of kale and Swiss chard, bananas and papayas and coconuts. And, and with a Purium program and an alkaline diet from Get Off Your Acid. And that's the, I'll, be, I'll do one month of that. And then when I get the Nazare in September, I'll do a really intense month of breath work. And I'll feel I'll be ready for anything after that, as long as I stick to that program. The um, exercise program that your trainer has you on, is it weightlifting and cardio? Is it stretching? It's mostly um, very focused Weight lift, weightlifting with machines mostly, but I also use weights while I'm on the machines. 
and a, so a really in, targeted ab program that's very subtle but with amazing results and then i go to uh kai Borg. kai garcia has a more of a functional fitness where it's all cardio my trainer says just do her program with the machines and the weights and then a beach workout a really amazing beach workout but i love the camaraderie at kai Borg's gym and I, it's all my friends that i grew up with that went to high school with and we all love and support each other. And it's, it's just the best feeling to really get the blood pumping with the boys. And um, that's, yeah, I really, and then when I work out with Sherry, she's starting to ramp it up to where we're really getting the blood pumping as well. And um, the breath work is, is uh, best done in the water when you're getting pounded, but there's some amazing breath work on the land with, Wim Hof and just when I'm doing my workout I do breath exercises in between sets what's your do you have a policy for alcohol what role does it play I would say alcohol is definitely not recommended when training and not ever you know alcohol is just straight sugar and it through camp your it uh throws your body's chemical it gives you a chemical imbalance you go you spike your body with all the sugar you feel all good you're having a great time and the next day you're like wah, wah. so alcohol is definitely not recommended um you know i'll have a drink of glass of wine here and there and if i'm not training i might go on a little trip with my wife somewhere and go eat at all these amazing places and have a few glasses of wine but other than that i don't drink alcohol at all got it um i never hear anybody talk about the boards that you're writing who who shapes them uh, so Mercedes designed this board with us in Portugal that is the best. It's the same board that everybody had access to the first, you know, 10. I let everybody have access to what we created. And then uh, they all morphed it into their own version of it. And it's, uh, you know, 20 pounds lead weight between the feet. So there's no swing weight really flexible in the nose so you can it's like a dampener when you hit the chops it, so your body doesn't take all the all the all the um compression when you're hitting these chops the board takes it and um it goes fast and it turns good and there's been a lot of guys playing around with different things and you know these kids are so good so they can almost ride anything so i wouldn't judge if the board is good or not, if Kai or Lucas is riding them, because those guys could literally ride a door. But the other side is they have the access to these amazing shapers and trying all these different boards until they find out what works really good for them. So they probably do have the best boards, but I wouldn't judge if the board is good or not with them riding it because they can ride a door. Well, uh, I've Rusty, seen the, Rusty I've seen the, Diego, uh, Rusty is my man for, for guns and he is the, the best. Uh, he, we have this 10 six that is magic every time. And it's so good. Do you ride the guns as quads? Yes. All quads. Okay. Well, it took me a long time to transfer over and I was really stoked on my thrusters. But once I got the right recipe on the quad, I use these little 375 future fins in any conditions, uh, all four of them. And a stay covered makes the best leashes in the world, bar none. They are just uh, indestructible. I've only broken one stay covered leash in all these years, and it was because the fin cut it crazy and shorter like eight or nine feet 10 feet at the longest you can get your board quicker the, the challenge with the shorter leash is that the board is closer to you so right. there's a little more danger there but so you got to weigh it out how close do i want it so i can get it quick so i can get around the next wave but how far do i need it so it's not going to hit me in the head and you got to decide what you are comfortable with i i like nine or ten feet um I've seen the Mercedes Benz logo on those tow boards. I just figured that they were, it was just a sponsor logo and that somebody else was building the boards. Are they standard polyurethane uh, construction other than the lead weight? 
the bummer about that whole situation is that they didn't showcase it in the well maybe they'll showcase it in the second up second season because i'm you know hoping to get a second season um and they flew me to germany first they pitched me so i get the world record they come to nazareth to pitch me to sponsor me that doesn't happen in surfing so then they say we want to be we don't want to just give you cars and sit on the beach we want to help design and produce the magic board for you, a board that will help you stay alive. The, we want to produce a board that will keep you alive. And they flew me straight to Germany. I brought the board that I liked with me and we studied it and they studied all the materials they use and just came up with a PVC stringer, plastic stringer, like, a, a, like the PVC pipes. Yep. You know, the white PVC pipes, that's the stringer. And the carbon fiber is the back two thirds of the board and polyester is the front third with PVC and only four layers, two layers of glass on the top, two layers of glass on the bottom and the front. And then it gets a little thicker and more material on the back. So it's stiff and keeps that, keeps the speed going forward without flexing flexes on the front. And um, yeah, they can. And then we put the weight in the board. The weight was always on top of the board with Stretch, who I was working with up until then. Yep. And then with Brewer, we put the weight in the glass job, so the, the weight was everywhere. Yep. With Mercedes, we put the weight in the board between the feet so that there's no swing weight. And then that is the most crucial part of the board. If the weight is an inch up, it bow steers and you and you catch your nose. If the weight is an inch back, it wheelies and you fly out of the water. So the most crucial part of the whole thing was getting that weight in the exact spot besides, you know, the, the shape and the, the thickness and the glass job and the fin placement. I mean, every aspect is, was important, but right. you know, one little thing off and it doesn't work. Like the, the, they were making a bunch of boards for other surfers and everybody's loving them and then it's spo out of a uh, out of portugal and then the guy started putting this crazy edge and it wasn't tucked under and it was super abrupt change in the flow of the rail and this edge started in the tail and never tucked under way up and so the boards wouldn't turn Oh. And I saw the board and the guys were like, everybody started not liking the boards. And then I went and sanded one for one of my friends and fixed the edge. And he's like, holy shit, it's magic. Okay. So yeah, the <laughs> little the sanders, sanders can make or break it, even though the shaper is the one who gets all the credit. It's crazy. The sander does, right? <laughs> totally. Um, well, does this kind I mean, I feel like you've been at it obviously for a long time, like I said, with not maybe not as much recognition as you deserve. Do you feel like this HBO documentary series is validation? Well, I never really wanted rec rec recognition. I always just wanted to hide from everybody. And and then since when now we got this recognition, now I got to do these podcasts and these interviews and i'm like people want to hear from you not do this stuff and she's like no you have to do it i'm like oh man i just want to relax <laughs> you can relax later the people want to hear from you um, that's what she says <laughs> no these are these are glorious insights it's funny you compiled all of this footage over the years and it's like now that um you know social media and youtube and all that exists people are compiled they're they're documenting it they're just publishing it instantly whereas i feel like you compiled all of it and archived it so that now hbo can come back and actually do a retrospective but um it's almost more valuable without publishing it daily in real time like having this as a piece feels more substantial than the twice a week vlogs that i watch you know or don't watch Thank you. That means a lot coming from you. And um, yeah, Chris Smith and Joe Lewis and the whole team at HBO. I mean, I have to give credit to Joe because Joe put the team together and 
Joe is just an amazing human being that, uh, you know, he's the guy who pulled in Chris Smith and then together, he's the one who believed in it. He believed in it. He, he believed in this story. He said, this is it. We got to do this. I can help you. If you want any help, I'll, I'll do whatever you need. And I can, if I can be involved, I'd love to be involved. We're like, what? Joe Lewis wants to be involved. Please run with it, Joe. <laughs> and then Chris came on, which was like, it's a godsend. There's a, the, the, the double-edged sword of Chris. Chris is the man. He's like the best. But then he just did Tiger King right after, uh, right? When oh, we, no. Uh, so everybody's like, oh, I don't know if I want to be in this doc. <laughs> 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 well, interestingly, through your years and maybe Nicole's guidance to work with non-endemic sponsors, um, I feel like you've become a recognizable name to the mainstream culture in a way that only a few other surfers ever have, like Bethany Hamilton, Laird Hamilton, and Kelly. And I feel like your name is kind of right in that list of people. Um and so whether or not it was an intentional decision 10 and 20 years ago, I think it's actually been a really savvy decision now. And you've followed through with the hard work of winning all the Guinness records and all that kind of stuff. But you, you know, it's like surfing is going mainstream and we've got the Olympics over here. We've got the WSL trying to do a reality show, but I feel like your version of going mainstream on HBO is actually the most authentic it's the most interesting story. It's um, it's the most significant achievement out of all of those things I just named. And so you should be proud, you earned it. Thank you. You're welcome. Congrats to you both of you. You should be proud, baby girl. <laughs> oh, man, you did all the work. <laughs> all right, well, I will tell everybody to watch it on July 18th, the premiere in post-production and direct them to uh, HBO and all that and your social media. But anything else you wanna say in signing off? Um, everything's possible, write that roadmap, get that blueprint, I live your it. dreams. Thank you, thank I'm you. Gonna, I'm gonna write my life plan down after we get off. <laughs> <laughs> Have a purpose driven life. Uh, Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. Have a good day. Thank you so much. It was so fun. Thank you. All right. All right.